I'm very excited for our after lunch keynote, which is going to be held by Peter Troxler. Peter Troxler is, for those of you working in open technology, of course, a big name as he's been so fundamental in shaping some many of the ideas that we are working on in different projects today. He's a research professor working on revolution in manufacturing at the Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences and has been studying the impact of new and digital technologies and methods such as 3D printing, the existence of fab labs, the different machines that go in them, design and manufacturing for many years now. And that's why it's fantastic to have him here. He's also on the advisory board of our MAKE project, which is one of our Horizon projects looking at distributed manufacturing, which is why it's fantastic to have Peter here today speaking on the topic of distributed manufacturing in connection to open source. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've got 15 minutes or 20 minutes or three hours. <laughs> so it's always a, a difficult slot to be in after lunch. Because lunch was brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm talking about distributed manufacturing today. Uh, and I'm asking the question, is distributed manufacturing there thanks to open source hardware. I've given this talk uh, a few times before in, in various contexts, even once with uh, the, the, the Belgian uh, Society of Engineers. They seem to be interested in exactly this question. Um, uh, as uh, you told the audience, I've been with Fab Labs since 2007. I've been the editor, the exec executive editor of the book Open Design Now, which we launched in this city in 2011. So that's about the time I've been working in and thinking about uh, distributed manufacturing, particularly in uh, the, the area of Fab Labs, and connected all those open source uh, ideas. I will talk on three topics in the coming few minutes. First, a little bit of history, because this is a historical moment today, 10 years of gig, congratulations. Very well done. Um, and you all know, the future has just begun. I'll talk a little bit about my findings uh, in, my, in my studies, and I would like to uh, consider three elements about uh, distributed manufacturing that are particularly relevant, I think, in the context of gig. And uh, there is one thought in there that I didn't include in earlier presentations, which gig made me include. So thank you to that. Um, history. Uh, it's not only 10 years of gig, it's 30 years of open source hardware. Uh, you see there, 1993, the Taper Radio Amateur Community is probably the first documented open source hardware community in modern times. Um, I guess there's a lot of open source and sharing that has gone on before 1993, obviously. <laughs> Such as blast furnaces in England were a collective endeavor until some guy started to patent them. Like early airplanes were a collective endeavor. You see there the, the photo of the first flight of the White Brothers, which lasted some 70 seconds or 90 seconds, something like that. This was a shared endeavor. People were copying their uh, designs to be able to start to fly until some clever guy started to patent them. And you see a uh, very ancient uh, computer. Somebody in the room uh, recognizes this beauty, the PD PDP-10. That was just before uh, particularly the Americans thought that you should be able to copyright protect software, which led to a few guys revolting, probably well known, which led to the workhorses of the web today, like the Apache uh, HTTP server, which is really one of the workhorses making the World Wide Web work, which is open source, or the infamous 
Log4j, uh, uh, known for its uh, flaws and troubles, which is a little, little engine that's used everywhere to just log what's going on. Fast forward to open source hardware. Uh, you've seen on an earlier slide that comes the 21st century, comes associations that want to deal with, work with, promote open source hardware. And we all know uh, those nice examples, certainly the RepRap, kind of an icon of open source hardware. On the right hand side, you see the electronics boards, uh, the Arduino, the Raspberry Pi, the microbit used in uh, education a lot, used in hobby, hobby projects, in arts projects a lot. Um, left bottom is a very nice uh, example that ties into the repair discussion. Bang & Olufsen uh, produced beautiful speakers in the 70s and 80s. Um, but now their amplifiers are all wireless. So the speakers are essentially hard to connect, except that Bang & Olufsen came up with an open source board that, can, that you can add to the speakers to make them wireless. So no need to throw your beautiful b and speakers away. And uh, bottom center, another uh, favorite uh, pro project of mine, this really comes from science. This comes from CERN in Geneva. It's called the White Rabbit Project. And it's basically uh, some kind of like a stopwatch for elementary particles. Um, all the sensors in, in, in CERN um, are connected through internet. And we know that internet is not actually a technology that is um, very good at timing, because it was actually designed to not depend on time. So with the White Rabbit Project, CERN made uh, the, 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 the Ethernet um, technology time sensitive. And they produced uh, this stopwatch, as I call it, um, in open source for a good reason. They wanted it quickly, and they wanted it to work. So they made their designs open source, so suppliers could chime in and tell them, if you change the circuit like this or like that, it's going to work better. Electronics engineers understand what I'm talking about, right? Um, other examples of open source hardware are here. And this is, this is in, in hardcore uh, open source hardware uh, uh, circles, a very controversial picture. Because in the center, this uh, cargo bike is not exactly open source. But the makers use the term open source to brand their thing as cool. Um, similar story with the local motors, this car on the left-hand side, where they tried to go into venture capital with open source hardware and failed. Logically, that's the system. Um, on the right-hand side, a uh, very known example, you see those tables in many, many, many co-working spaces. Um, uh, 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 the company is called Open Desk because they started with designing an open source uh, desk. And they really established a network of distributed manufacturers um, across the globe where you can order those desks and get them manufactured locally. Or if you own a CNC mill and are handy enough, you can build them uh, yourselves. We do have, in the meantime, a DIN uh, uh, Deutsche Industrie Norm spec um, defining the vocabulary of open source hardware. So things are moving. And sometimes we think things are moving slowly with open source hardware, because we have those uh, quick things in open source software. This is not always the case. On the left hand side, you see the development of Python. And on the right hand side, you see the evolvement from the RepRap in 2006 to 2012, and you see the, the, the sort of many, many, many hundreds of 3D printers um, that were uh, designed on the basis of the RepRap. I'll come to that back in a minute. But now um, I'd like to touch on three relevant issues when we talk about open source hardware, which are exactly relevant for uh, distributed manufacturing. So the first is that one. 
When you look at distributed and not your centralized factory, you will have to deal with very different environments and very different knowledge, capabilities, and capacities of manufacturing. On the left-hand side, your typical fab lab uh, CNC mill. In the center, an industrial CNC mill. And on the right-hand side, uh, manual carpentry. That's the range of capacities you probably will have to deal with when um, dealing with distributing manufacturing. So you get difference in capacities, difference in standards, and difference in understanding what you mean by quality. Another issue, funny anecdote in uh, 2012, I think, I was organizing an open source hardware track at the Open uh, Knowledge Festival in Helsinki. And we invited this guy, Taylor Hawkinson, from the US because he built this open source desktop CNC table mill. And we wanted to have a workshop to build exactly that mill. So he arrived with his drawings. And the first thing he had to do is to convert the drawings from imperial to metric. That done, um, he went shopping for standard materials. But the standard MDF that he used, even when conver converted to metric, was just not available in Finland. They have other standard thicknesses of MDF sheets. Um, so, in terms of materials, you challenged with av availability. And I mean, you guys from Africa know much better than me here in uh, rich Berlin or Rotterdam um, what material availability means. You're looking at standards, as, as I explained in the example. And uh, you're obviously looking at circularity of materials. Distributed manufacturing has been studied ages ago. This is a study from uh, 10 years ago, where uh, specialists at IBM analyzed the hearing aid, a mobile phone, an industrial display, and the washing machine, and compared centralized manufacturing to distributed manufacturing. And they found out that with distributed manufacturing, the cost per piece would go down about 23, 23%. The minimum volume of production would go down 90%. That is an indicator for how big or small your factory can be. And they looked at the carbon footprint. And uh, well, it went down for the hearing aid. It went down for the mobile phone. It went slightly up for industrial displays. And it went up for washing machines. So there's another challenge again, uh, related to uh, materials used in question. Here on the right-hand side is, again, the gene gene genealogy, whoop, difficult word after lunch, um, of the RepRap. And uh, you know, that, that first dot is, is the initial RepRap, and the lines are the different families of 3D printers that, uh, that were made. So you see um, uh, in the top a photo of colleagues in Utrecht uh, in a fab lab um, assembling um, one of the RepRap models from which came um, bottom left uh, the first Ultimaker, um, from which also come the, uh, the latest uh, Prusa models. So what we see here is that um, open source hardware likes to fork. And this could be um, because of engineers suffer sometimes from the not invented here syndrome. They just know better. But it might also be due to localization. That stuff just works differently in different places. And I think that's, that to me is, is, is the important thought about gig. You're well aware of that, that those local differences do matter. And there's a big challenge when you, when you look at, at those uh, 
fanning out uh, genealogies of open source hardware? How do we organize federated learning across those families? When Prusa detects something that's really clever, how does Ultimaker notice that this would be really clever for them as well? So, we did some research on open source hardware and entrepreneurship and businesses and stuff that happened. And uh, we found essentially three things. The first thing is, and that ties back basically to the, to the repair discussion we had this morning. When we think about value, it's not value creation anymore. It's value conservation. So we think not in linear ways of production, but in circular ways of production. The second is, when we look at supply chain, Traditional manufacturer look at me, the focal firm, most important, I make money, like the BMWs in the discussion this morning, and the suppliers and the clients, well, you screw the suppliers to, to supply as cheaply as possible, and you screw, screw the customers to pay as much as possible. Open source hardware entrepreneurs see the supply side and the customer side very much as a community. Oh, have we heard that, that word before, gig? <laughs> this is a very important thought, and um, I'll come back to that at the very end. So hang on. Um, the distributed manufacturing, which I had in my title, I think I need to change after today and change it into networked manufacturing. Because we're not thinking of something centrally and then distribute it, go and execute. We need to take into context the, the local entanglement of the network. Hey, gig, that's you. So we've seen open source hardware happening. Uh, a lot of uh, 3D print entrepreneurs, that was one study I did. Um, we've seen, for instance, the WikiHow is a very beautiful project where you see the, the, the local adaption of, uh, of the, uh, the initial model. Uh, we've got the infrastructures in, in Fab Labs and, uh, and makerspaces and offene Werkstätten, etc. And we've seen distributed manufacturing happening very quickly in situations of crisis. And it's very funny that you programmed exactly this panel after my talk. Um, I did a little study into the maker's response to a COVID uh, in Europe. And what I found there, yes, the distributed or networked manufacturing, that worked. It, it kicked in very quickly. And it was, the network was able to produce massive amounts of stuff, useful stuff not just your Star Wars figurines, hey, hey. Um, but it also collapsed very quickly when resources ran out. Resources in terms of material, resources in terms of time, resources in terms of people, resources in terms of personal energy. Um, Andrew Lamb's story. So again, gig, keep that in mind. What to do? And that's my second last slide. This is a sort of theoretical way to look at designing um, developed by uh, Buchanan in 2001. This model goes from low to high complexity. Again, this topic that Andrew touched up uh, this morning. Um, and as we move from low complexity to high complexity, we think first about things, about experiences, about transformations. And we're not just designing symbols or products. We're designing interactions and designing systems and systems of systems. And this brings the whole theory together. You see the symbols, the products, the interactions. We think about community. Um, the systems, value systems, 
the localized entanglement, the design global, manufacturing local paradigm. Thank you. <laughs>